Hello, this is Yaro Starak, and welcome to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Today's guest is Harry Campbell. Hello, thank you for downloading this episode of the EJ podcast. Harry Campbell is going to share his ride sharing blogging journey in a moment. But I'd like to invite you now to subscribe to the EJ Podcast newsletter by going to interviewsclub.com and entering your email address into the form you will find on that blog post. You'll then be subscribed to my updates list where I send you my latest podcasts like this one with Harry as soon as I release them. And you'll also get a series of my very best podcasts that I've surfaced from my archives. So you will always have fresh entrepreneur and blogger interviews to listen to. That's interviewsclub.com. Now, here is the full interview with Harry. Hello, this is Yara Starek, and welcome to an Entrepreneur's Journey interview. Today's guest has a bit of a different business, not in the sense of a different business model. We're still talking about someone who blogs and sells information products and makes money online, but the topic isn't one that I've heard discussed before. So the topic is actually uh, ride sharing and the website in question is the rideshareguy.com run by Harry Campbell and Harry's currently making over 80,000 a year from this business and he sent me through his various income streams and how he does this and there's a lot of different ones some that I've never heard of before so I'm really interested in diving in to see how this relatively uh, new niche has kind of developed in the last few years and how Harry's turned into an online business so Harry thank you for coming on the show today awesome thanks for having me Yaro Right, so this is a little different. Normally, uh, you know, the, the the kind of niches are fairly well established. I'm thinking yeah. ride sharing is something, obviously, that's only been around for a, a short number of years now. So, you must have uh, jumped on the bandwagon, um, you know, pretty pretty early days to, to even start an online business about this. I'm thinking the blog itself isn't that many years old. Is that right? That is correct. So my blog is actually about a year and a half old and the industry itself, I mean, most people may or may not be aware, but I mean, it's basically companies like Uber and companies like Lyft and a lot of these delivery and logistic companies are starting to hire and basically allow people to do things on demand, whether they want a car ride on demand or food on demand or whatever it is. And my, my site kind of covers all of that. Okay, well, I'd love to hear how it all got started, but as is customary with the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast, I'd mm -hmm. love to know if you were an entrepreneur before this. So going back in time, did you um, you know, go to high school and university or what was your sort of career path early days? Yeah, so I had a probably a, a little bit different career path than most entrepreneurs. And I mean, especially growing up, I, d I never had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I grew up. I just kind of did entrepreneurial things here and there. And even through college, I worked jobs here and there that's somewhat entrepreneurial, but more just taking advantage of the certain opportunities. I mean, when I was little, I kind of have like a typical little entrepreneur kid story. I mean, I can share a funny one really quickly. Okay, go ahead. Is uh, when I was in high school, I remember that I used to in second in English class in second period, probably in tenth or eleventh grade. My mom used to make these really killer lunches, and they would have a full sandwich, chips, snacks, fruit, like a nice bottled drink, and all of that. And basically, <laughs> there was a girl next to me who was kind of jealous, and she used to always want my chips and you know they'd just be a little bag of Ziploc chips and so she would start offering me you know 50 cents 75 cents and then one day she offered me a dollar I said all right well I did I gave her them for a dollar and I had my mom start packing me an extra bag of chips every day <laughs> <laughs> and so from then on I was making you know five bucks a week off of basically zero work and I mean <laughs> obviously it's not a lot of money but that kind of style, I guess you would say, of entrepreneurial type things really interested me or something where I could literally do nothing and make $5 a week. And obviously, that's not a lot of money, but the return on my time, that's what I was looking at. I was saying, hey, I literally did zero work and I just made $5. That's what I really like to see. How did you justify with your mother for the extra pack of chips? Did you tell her you were capitalizing on her effort? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think at the time I didn't that wasn't the first time that I capitalized on her efforts. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> 
Fair enough. So you had you had some um, a workforce to get right away from day one, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think before that I had used her uh, when she used to have one of she she worked um, at a big uh, movie movie studio and she was one of the first people back in the '90s to have a cable line. And so when I was in, I think junior high or even elementary school, my friend and I were pretty computer savvy, and we set up a uh, a server on our computer, and we basically it was called Hotline back in these days where people were basically pirating movies <laughs> and we set it up on my mom's computer and made a bunch of cash that way so <laughs> I'm not sure you should admit this on the, the yeah, podcast I mean there. I think it was so long ago though and you know I don't think it can be traced back to me so I think I should be good <laughs> yeah we haven't mentioned your your home address yet so <laughs> all right good to go then awesome okay so uh, obviously some entrepreneurial drive of a, of a sort in there and certainly a desire to make some money off low yeah. effort activities. Yeah. Did, did, what did you actually like study in university? What was your degree? Um, so I actually went to school at UC San Diego. So in here in the U S in California and um, I studied aerospace engineering. So basically the exact opposite of writing and blogging. <laughs> okay. What was the plan? Um, well, the plan was, that, I mean, I've always been interested in math and science. I mean, like I said, I had an interest in computers. So when I went to college, I literally just picked my major as aerospace engineering because it seemed interesting. Um, and so I started on that path and I knew that I had an interest in computers, took my first programming class. And that's when I realized that I hated programming and never wanted to look at that again. <laughs> Um, so I kind of continued on that engineering path and it was definitely tough. It was a lot of work. And I mean, especially compared to what my friends were doing at the time, I had friends graduating in three years from school and four years. And for me, it took five years, had to do summer school. Um, and I mean, I, I did well in school. I got good grades, but I knew that, you know, engineering kind of, it was something I was interested in. I kind of towards the end started realizing that it was something that was going to pay well and also that I'd most likely be able to get a job in too, which at the time in 2009 was pretty important because that was kind of a low point in the U.S. economy and not a ton of people were getting jobs straight out of college. So did you get a job straight out of college? Yeah, uh, fortunately, I actually even landed a job in San Diego. So I was able to stay in San Diego with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and live in San Diego. So I worked for three or four years at a company called Goodrich Aerostructures, and I was a structural engineer um, before moving up to Orange County. And then I worked for Boeing for a couple of years as another, in another engineering position before finally uh, leaving my job full time to focus on the blog full time. Okay, so t tell us how this crossover begins. So you're, you're in a job. Did you mm -hmm. sort of see this ride sharing industry pop up and, and even start doing a bit of driving you know, or to yeah, augment your so income? Let me let me rewind it a okay. little bit because I know you want to. I know you like to get the full history. So For sure. yes, <laughs> I actually back when I was living in San Diego. So in about 2010, 2011, I had a big interest in personal finance. So. I mean, I was reading blogs, going on forums like the Bogleheads, which is a big personal finance and investing forum. And basically, it was the first time in my life where I was making real money. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an insane amount of money, but it was more money than I really need, more money than I needed. And I wanted to make sure that I was investing it properly. And like probably a lot of other entrepreneurs in your audience, I realized pretty quickly that this wasn't something I want to do for the rest of my life. I didn't want to be sitting in a cubicle for the rest of my life. And I know that that's kind of a cliched story. But for me, um, it wasn't that I hated my job. I definitely didn't hate my job. I actually liked it. Um, I just knew that it wasn't something I could see my see myself doing forever. And I, so I really just took an interest into personal finance and thinking about, hey, how can I invest in things like real estate? How can I invest in stocks or bonds or whatever I need to do to kind of set my financial future in order? And really what attracted me the most was blogs. I wasn't reading any of the big sites. You know, I was reading a lot of just blogs. And after about six months, 12 months of reading those, I said, hey, you know what, this is pretty interesting, but I don't really see anything out there that's really specific to my situation. I mean, there are a couple blogs for young professionals, but I mean, no one's really talking about all the different issues because as a young professional, you have a million different things that are going on in your life. And so I started, so I started my own blog and I still own it to this day. Um, it's called Your PF Pro, and so your personal finance pro. And I kind of geared it towards young professionals, and it wasn't necessarily super successful, but it definitely 
Um, I still remember the first time I made my first dollar on that site. And that was really what kind of opened up my eyes into the world that, hey, I started this thing as a passion project, as just something I was interested in. I, when I started that blog, I had no idea that you could even make money. And I didn't really have the intention to make money. I just really wanted to put my thoughts down on digital paper. And I was a really bad writer at the time. I still remember the first article I wrote. It was something about your credit score. And it was really bad. But over time, I kind of got a lot better. And that, that was kind of the first project that really opened up my eyes to the world of online marketing and blogging and all of that good stuff. When was this? 2011, did you say? Yeah, that was about 2011. So what sort of technical background did you enter this field with? Did you, you know, said know how to set up a blog or did you sort of have to figure all this out by yourself? I mean, honestly, I set it all up in one day. Um, you know, I just, I think that's the biggest thing. I think especially with your first blog, I mean, it most likely isn't going to be a home run, but there's just so much that you need to learn and so much that... Um, you know, that you can basically learn from doing. And I remember it was a Saturday in San Diego. It was raining, which it never rains in San Diego. And I was just thinking to myself, what am I going to do with my day? So I went to a coffee shop and set up my blog in one day um, from beginning to end. And I mean, by the end, it probably wasn't perfect, but it was a finished product. I still remember that's when I kind of first started discovering a lot of online resources, you know, the how to start a blog type guys like Pat Flynn, who I know you've had on your show way back in the past. Um, and uh, so that that's really how I got started, Re really with no... I mean, I had a technical background with computers and things like that, but I knew nothing about blogging. And I think a lot of people... Uh, don't realize how easy it is to start a blog. Uh, and I mean, that's kind of the nice thing, though. A lot of these blogging softwares are built for people who don't know how to do it, basically. Mm. So you just chose a domain name and registered some hosting and installed WordPress? Simple as that? Yep. I literally just... I, I think I had a few names written down and then I just kind of played around with it and went for it. So I think that's another thing is kind of just going ahead and doing it because obviously you can research and spend time looking at how to do it and researching and coming up with ideas. But at the end of the day, the hardest part is going to be to go out and do it. And I think kind of taking that first step or that first leap is where a lot of people get tripped up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... You said you said your plan was to just throw some digital content out there. You had things mm -hmm. you were thinking about in your own life as a young professional and, and in finance and investing. Now, if you were aware, certainly of you know guys like Pat Flynn and so on, you must have knew there was potential to make money. So there probably was a little bit of an agenda there. At least you know you, you thought well, it was an, an option. Yeah, actually, I mean, at that time, I was only using those resources more for the how to get started. I right. literally was very green. I didn't know how to how, what WordPress was. I mean, I didn't know how to install this stuff. I was just figuring it out. And I mean, obviously, just to get started and to post an article isn't too difficult. But all of the encompassing promotion and marketing yourself, and that's where I wasn't probably until about a year or two later where I really started, I mean, really started seeing the pen potential. And it took me about six, six or nine months before I got my first paid um, gig from that. And that's kind of when I started thinking to myself, hey, there's, there could be some real opportunity here because I know that my site at the time was only getting a few hundred people a day. And I extrapolated those numbers and I could only imagine what a site that was getting hundreds of thousands of people you know, a month, with mm. what they would be making. So for me, I've always been, obviously as an engineer, I've always been analytical and seeing what other people are doing and kind of extrapolating what I'm doing to that. And I, it was pretty, the writing was kind of on the wall if I could get to that point that I would be doing pretty well. What was that first payday? So that first payday on your PF Pro, I still remember it. It was a sponsored post. So it was some, and it was before I even knew what a sponsored post really was. And when I, when I started this site, a lot of personal finance bloggers were taking advantage of sponsored posts, which for many in your audience, they may or may not know, but it's basically when a company comes to you and wants to post an article on your site with a link back to their site so they can get, you know, SEO benefit and a related link. Now, obviously sites like from Forbes or from Huffington Post are a lot more valuable, but these companies still pay, you know, anywhere from, 
25, 50 bucks to a hundred, two hundred dollars sometimes. And I remember it was seventy-five dollars. All she wanted me to do was copy and paste this article onto my site, obviously with a link back to their site. And I didn't really understand why. I, it, it almost seemed kind of like a, a joke to me. I said, "Really? <laughs> you just want me to copy and paste this article, and I make seventy-five dollars?" So again, it was kind of that return on my time thing, where I said, "Hey, I'm doing two minutes of work now, and I'm making seventy-five dollars." And that was kind of the first time I realized kind of the value of, well, first of all, the value of SEO and kind of linking and all that stuff. Um, but just more the power of, I guess you would almost say the internet and blogging that someone like me who literally started this project solely because it was something I was interested in, um, I was now making my first $75 off mm -hmm. of it. And I saw a ton of potential. Before we dive into sort of the progression of this, I'm always curious that the first six to nine months you said to the point where you then had this payday, $75. Mm -hmm. I don't know, did they approach you or did... did they approached know? me, yeah. Okay, so you must have been on their radar somehow. What did you do in that first six to nine months to grow your audience and yeah. you know, what was your content strategy? Yeah, and so really, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did do a lot of everything. So I mean, I was producing three articles a week. So I was doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I think after about... Once I started making money, I ended up hiring a writer to take over Wednesdays. So then I still produced Monday, Friday. And my content strategy was really to just write about whatever the heck I wanted, <laughs> whatever was interesting to me. And that would kind of prove... I, I kind of learned a lot from that content strategy that maybe it's not the best strategy and that you really need to focus on a niche, which we'll obviously go into later. But as far as content, I was really just writing about whatever interested me. And for the writing, I mean, it was extremely easy for me to pop out a couple, two to three articles a week on top of my day job. It was almost no work at all. I could do it in 45 minutes to an hour. But other than that, as far as marketing and promoting my stuff, really, what I did was I just interacted with a lot of other bloggers. So I was commenting on a ton of other personal finance sites. And obviously, when you comment, you can leave uh, a link um, to your website in the comment field, or you know, not in the actual comment field, but where it goes name, website, and email. And so I would leave that there. And I was getting traffic back from there. And I was reaching out to other bloggers, doing things like guest posts. And then a lot of personal finance bloggers at the time were also doing roundups. So I was setting up all these relationships with other bloggers. And basically, hey, they would link to my site in a Friday roundup of all the top personal finance news. And I would link to them. And then I would all, I was also setting up a Twitter agreement. So we would set up automatically. And I, I found a, I was using a couple programs that did it automatically, but some people are doing it manually, where basically every time I released a new post, they would tweet it to their audience and I would tweet their new post to my audience. So I was doing a lot of kind of manual grassroots type work to really get the word out about my site. And it obviously worked. Um, for your PF Pro, it... Kind of worked. Kind of worked. Okay. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I ended up uh, at its peak, I was getting about a thousand people a day, which, um, may seem like a decent number, but I think kind of in the scope of personal finance blogs, it was pretty small. And I never made more than at its peak, I was probably making around two or $3,000 a month off that site, mainly off sponsored posts, some affiliate stuff, but I was putting in a lot of work. And I, I, what really, what, what I really saw though was that I, I wasn't able to stand out. I mean, there was hundreds or thousands of other personal finance bloggers, and obviously I'm biased, but I thought my content was really good. But there just wasn't a way for me to stand out because we were all talking about the same stuff. And when there's hundreds of people, obviously that's a lot of noise, and it's really difficult to stand out. Just before we move away from the personal finance, I'd just love to know also how you went from your first seventy-five dollar payday to you know two to three thousand a month because that's a that's yeah. a full-time income for a lot of people. So you know they'd be pretty happy with that. Even if you are doing it a hundred percent with guest posts, you might have this yeah. you know guest post blog only. But um, you know, yeah, how, no. how, how did it happen? Definitely, that's a good point because I mean, at the time, and you know, the thing with the get the, the sponsored posts, it was very cyclical, and I think just at that 
for about a year. There were a lot of people making a lot of money off of it. And basically how it happened was I, you know, I had a standard contact page on my site, but really what it was was I started network, kind of leverage my network of other bloggers and we would all share advertising contacts at the beginning of every month. So I would send them everyone who I was using and maybe it only started off I only had two or three people that were contacting me because obviously I didn't know where to find these people, but you know, they there's so many people out there that need links and that were doing SEO. And as you know, it's a huge, probably billion dollar industry. So there's a lot of people that need links and there are a lot of really high high valuable uh, products in the personal finance space. So I think that that's why there are so many people looking for these sponsored posts and looking for these links. And so really it was a combination of people contacting me, me building up a database of advertisers. I would go in every three months and email all of them in one mass email and say, hey, you know, here are my rates. I know we've advertised in the past or I know we've talked about advertising in the past. And then also networking with other bloggers. And obviously if they've worked with someone in the past month and they send me that lead. That's a much hotter lead than someone who I reach out to, you know, three months later who emailed me once. So I know that they had closed a deal. I know for how much. And so I had a lot more information to go on. And that's really how I built it up and kind of took advantage of it. I kind of struck while the opportunity was hot. It started to die down. And I mean, I still do sponsored posts and still have some affiliate type stuff going over the going on over on that site, but it's not near um, what it was, I guess, at its peak. And also because I don't spend, I, I spend almost no time on that site going forward. Now I spend maybe 20 to 30 minutes a month going forward on that site. Right. So it sounds like network contacts was a huge part of the success of, of that first blog. But yeah. for some reason, you decide not to keep going. So what happened there? Well, it just, it seemed that it wasn't scalable. A lot of the work that I was doing was like manual contact manual uh, commenting and stuff like that. So that was the problem that a lot of it was really just tough to kind of scale up a lot of the work. And I was also finding that it was just hard to stand out that I didn't have. I mean, I wanted to be a lot. I want, I mean, I was kind of doing I was doing well with that blog, but I was really at the same place as a lot of other bloggers. And there were a lot of people making good money at the time. But I knew that the top bloggers were making a lot more money. And that was kind of where I wanted to be. Mm. Okay, so you, you didn't see a path forward to become a top blogger in that space. Well, I, I saw I didn't see a path going forward just just because I mean there may have been the possibility, but I didn't have that really killer idea or I didn't have that niche that could stand out. And I think that obviously there's also a huge first mover advantage with a lot of these niches. I mean a lot of the most successful personal finance blogs are you know, five to six years old or seven to eight years old. And mine was only, you know, mine kind of was two or three years late, I guess you would say. I think that if I would have started it when there was less competition, I would have had a much more, I would have had a much greater chance for success, for real, real big success, I guess you would say. Right. Okay. So did you, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. I still consider that blog successful. It's still bringing in a thousand dollars a month. It's brought in at least a thousand dollars a month for three or four years now. So I would definitely say that that's successful. And at this point, I have a writer who manages everything for me, and I spend twenty to thirty minutes a week on it or a month on it. So it's very low effort and still able to make some money. Mm, okay, fantastic. So. I'm guessing, based on the way you're talking about this, you said, you know what, I want to be the leader in a space. Where's yep. a new market I can be a, a first mover in? Is that sort of what happened? Exactly. That's exactly what happened. And that's really, that was kind of about halfway into my ownership of your PF Pro. And that's really when I started just doing my research and started following guys like Pat Flynn. And he was really one of the main guys that I followed just because more because of time constraints than anything, but also just looking and kind of learning um, about about what other people were doing, what niches had been successful in the personal finance space. I had a friend who ran a blog for doctors. That, so it was a personal finance blog for doctors called The White Coat Investor. And he really, you know, that was one of the examples to me that really stood out because he here he went and, you know, like I said, there's that first mover advantage, but he came in super late to the game, but he found this niche that turned out to be huge. And I mean, personal finance products like insurance and loans for doctors, you can imagine Imagine that those are some very high, <laughs> you know, affiliate products. You know, very high payouts for 
for affiliates and things like that. So it was kind of, it was just more, it wasn't that I needed a new niche. I just needed something where I saw opportunity that I could really go out and there weren't a million other people doing it. That's what I was looking for. And, you know, I saw that, you know, I knew a lot of guys at the time were doing niche sites on, I still remember that I was reading stuff about people who had started sites on things like camping knives and, <laughs> you know, maybe mattresses and stuff like that. And for me, though, I also realized that it needed to be something I was passionate about. Because if I just went out and started a niche site about camping knives or, you know, blow up mattresses, that that probably wouldn't be able to hold my interest for very long. And so that was the other thing that was I started realizing that was really important to me. It had to be something I was passionate about. I was super passionate about personal finance, still am to this day. Um, and, but I, I just needed something where there was also the opportunity. Okay. So how did you pick ride sharing as that niche? Well, I definitely got lucky because <laughs> I think that's a, another thing that people often underestimate that it definitely helps to be prepared and it helps to be good at what you're doing, but it also pays to be lucky at times too. And I actually started, so I was working full time up in Orange County, just south of LA um, at, for Boeing as an engineer. And I was a big passenger of Uber and Lyft. I was taking them all the time and using them. I loved the service. And every driver that I got in the car with, though, they were always trying to convince me to be a driver. I didn't really understand why, but they made it seem like such a great gig. Later, I would figure out that it was because they got a very nice referral fee if they referred me. And that's why every driver was trying to convince me to become a driver. But uh, that's really how I got started. I was a passenger. And one day I just said, hey, you know, all these drivers are telling me how awesome it is. And it was really funny that it kind of goes back to the story. But it was one driver in particular who said that since Lyft, who is kind of a competitor to Uber, had just launched in Orange County, they were actually paying drivers $35 an hour, whether they got rides or not. So it was a guaranteed $35 an hour, no other requirements. And he said that he was just sitting on his couch most of the time. And then if he got a ride, he would get up and go and then go back home. And so immediately I, I thought to myself, <laughs> hey, 35 bucks an hour to watch Netflix, that sounds like a pretty good deal. It's your, it's your mom all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And obviously, these are limited time opportunities, right? That, yeah. That's not a viable business model forever. But I said, hey, strike while the iron's hot. I signed up. By the time I got signed up and got going, that promotion was gone. But I was still went out there and I start, still started making some money. And I was making... When Lyft and Uber first started in my city, obviously, they were paying a lot more. There weren't nearly as many drivers. So I was making pretty solid income as a driver, at least $20 to $30 an hour, sometimes if it was really busy or if on holidays, $30 to $40 an hour. And I mean, at that $30, $40 to $40 an hour, that was more than I was making at my day job. So mm -hmm. I was definitely looking at it as a very nice side source of income on top of my day job since I could do it around my schedule on weekends or at nights or whenever I wanted really. And I think within the first week or two of driving though, I started having all these questions, right? Because it seems pretty easy. I mean, the idea of ride sharing and Uber and Lyft seems pretty easy for a driver. You pick someone up at point A and then drop them off at point B. But unfortunately, there's all this other stuff that goes into it that a lot of people don't realize. And I was a member of a bunch of Facebook Facebook groups basically for drivers and I started seeing I hopped on there and everyone was asking the same questions hey how do you get signed up what do you do if you have five people that want to get in the car what do you do if they try to bring alcohol in the car all of these kind of policy type questions everyone who wanted to learn about taxes and insurance and basically I just I, I, I saw all these people asking the same questions over and over and I immediately went to Google and I Googled rideshare blog or Uber blog or something like that. And I couldn't find a single one. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself at that time, I think Uber was maybe worth 5 or $10 billion. And I was trying to do some calculations in my head. All right, there's at least, there's probably four or 5,000 drivers in this LA Facebook group that I was in. So I could kind of extrapolate from there. There's maybe 100,000 drivers at the time, five, ten $10 billion industry, not a single blog that I could find, you know, there may have been one or two small sites, but nothing with consistent content like you would normally see in a more established niche. And a light bulb kind of went off in my head. And that next day, I went out and started the rideshare guy. And things kind of took off from there. 
So given the experience you had with your personal finance blog, you must have had more of a, a strategy and a, a kind of a structure you were planning to execute with the second blog. Can you maybe explain you know, what was your plan with this? Definitely. Yeah. And that was, I think, that uh, maybe a lot of people who come to my site and read my story, they may not, they may not realize that because I don't, obviously, I don't talk a lot about all of my Your PF Pro, Pro back, excuse me, my Your PF Pro background and kind of how I got into blogging. I mainly just kind of keep it to the topics that people care about, the ride sharing and Uber and Lyft and all of that stuff. So I didn't, just start. Yeah, exactly. I didn't just start the rideshare guy and put up articles and hope that people would come. I still had a lot of struggles and I still learned a lot with the rideshare guy, but I had a very specific strategy in mind. And I knew that, hey, this was definitely something at the time I was very passionate about. It was something the industry, I mean, it was a really exciting time. I mean, people were making a lot of money. The Uber, the Uber itself was valued at a lot of money. They were paying out huge referral bonuses. I actually signed up. I went... I was a Lyft driver at first. I signed up for Uber and they gave me a $500 sign up bonus for doing one ride. That was it. Wow. No requirements after that. I didn't have to keep driving. I did keep driving with them. I didn't have to though. And that just kind of shows you that kind of the, the status of things, how things were and how things honestly still are that the, the income for drivers has gone down a bit, but these companies are still spending money to recruit drivers and just the industry itself is very dynamic. But um, I think as far as like my actual strategy, when I first started this site, I went in and the first thing I did was I kind of came up with my own plan, what I was going to do, how many articles a week I was going to release. And I decided on, I was going to continue with that Monday, Wednesday, Friday of releasing articles. And I knew that I probably wouldn't be able to maintain that forever, but I figured that I'd be able to hire a writer or I just wanted to see how things were going to go. And I wanted to get a lot, obviously, especially at the beginning, I wanted to get content up. But I think that's also a big mistake that a lot of people oftentimes make is they go out and they try to release too many articles um, per week to start. A lot of people, I mean, when you're doing three articles a week is very manageable. But once you get into that 10th, 15th, 20th week, you're now starting to write a lot of content <laughs> and mm. people can run out of ideas. So for me, I wanted to pick something that I, I mean, I knew that I would be able to, I, I went and I created a list of maybe 50 to 100 ideas. So for article topics and they were, they came off the top of my head like it was nothing, right? I had, I knew that I had plenty to talk about. And really what I did from there was I started leveraging a lot of my existing contacts. So I went out to all of my personal finance contacts and since there was kind of a relation between working and make. I kind of used that angle of, hey, I'm working a side hustle. And that's how I pitched all. And obviously, a lot of these people were my friends. So they all kind of had to say yes to me guest posting on their site. Um, and of course, that's so that's a little bit of kind of how I got more of a grassroots word out. Um, that was part of my strategy. And obviously, I knew that there would be big SEO benefit, especially when I was just getting started and I had no links. So I went out and guest posted on 10 or 20 of my friends' personal finance sites. And that actually... And a few of them are still ranking very highly and I'm still getting traffic from them every single day. And I really just kind of talked about my story about how... I was either making money with Uber and Lyft on the side and really kind of leverage my existing network of contacts. So that was kind of one angle of it. Um, and then beyond that, I took a really grassroots approach to marketing. I knew that, hey, I mean, I knew that if I went out and wrote this stuff, no one would come read it. People aren't going to... If people don't know that it's there, obviously, they can't find it. And that's one of the big mistakes. Another big mistake people make, they kind of put that content out there, expect people to read it. And as you probably are aware, marketing is like most of the game, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's half the battle after you create that content is getting it out there. And so I wouldn't say that... I really kind of discovered along the way the marketing side of things because I had a bunch of ideas in my head, but some of them worked out well and some of them didn't work out so well as far as getting my contact content out there, especially when I was first getting started. Can you maybe give us a few more of the different marketing things that mm -hmm. did work in terms of getting the early days going? Yeah, definitely. And sorry, I just needed a, a break. A break, yeah. Of water. I'm also <laughs> curious, one thing you haven't sort of touched on here. It sounds like you're very clear on content and marketing, but mm -hmm. what was your strategy with monetization for the rideshare guide? Did you have a clear path for that or plan? Um, you know what? I really had no clear path for monetization. I think for me, it was just more that I knew that there would be opportunity down the road. 
And I wasn't sure exactly where it would come from, but I knew that there was opportunity. And when I started my site, actually, there were driver referrals. So people were basically making money off of referring new drivers and people are still making a lot of money off that today. And when we talk about some of my my current monetization strategies, I can definitely go into more detail. But at the time, I was really ex- actually expecting, I mean, Uber and Lyft were paying out some pretty big bonuses in the two to 300, four to 500 range, depending on the city and the situation. And at the time when I started my blog, I actually wasn't counting on that though. I was, I was thinking those driver referral bonuses were going to go away. So if, if my site did take off in three to six months, I figured that those driver referrals were going to be gone. And that was really the only potential monetization opportunity I saw at the beginning. I didn't think about advertisers. I just knew that if I, I I just kind of knew that if I built it, they will come. Right. Right. (laughs) So that was really my, I guess that was my monetization strategy. Okay. So then I can see why your, your focus was so heavily on content and marketing because you were thinking numbers need lots of people. Then I'll work out money afterwards. It's almost like a startup strategy, get as many users as you can. So, so what worked in terms of the marketing? marketing because i can imagine all right you registered the domain you got the mm-hmm. blog up there you're writing three articles a week you go and do all these guest posts on your your personal finance connections which yeah. yes great for a little bit of exposure perhaps not i mean i, I can see the relation as a, yep. a way to make money so that connects to personal finance but it's still not like it's a little slice that's yeah, slightly one definitely. step to the left of this subject so you must have had to have I don't know, gone. I could actually imagine you would have got a lot of potential opportunities just because it was, and it still is, a hot topic. And with not many Mm -hmm. other people writing about it, you would have potentially had uh, anyone, Mashable, TechCrunch, anytime an article comes up about Uber and they want a a respected expert's opinion, you might start being able to benefit from that. Certainly, I can tell you do that today, but you know, even in the early days, was that an option? Yep. Well, I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't really realize the power of the media until later on. I wish that I could say that I started leveraging the media right at the start, but I really didn't. And you're right. At the time, it was such a hot industry and still is today that there were so many articles being written about it. It just didn't. I wish that I would have because I probably would have seen success a lot sooner. But um, I still I still was able to... And you're right. So with the personal finance guest posts, that really wasn't my target audience, but I knew that that would be a really, that was to me, that seemed like a really easy, low hanging fruit, right? At the time I had no links, I had no SEO benefit, and I don't really know a ton about SEO. I just know that you need a lot of links from related sites (laughs) that are, you know, kind of in your niche or, you know, that have good SEO rankings themselves. And so that was really my angle with that. I said, hey, this is an easy, low-hanging fruit. I'll go guest post, get the word out, get some content going, get all these links back to my site. But it's simultaneously at the same time, that definitely wasn't the only thing I was doing. I was doing a ton of different stuff. So I was doing a lot of... I mean, I had a really easy resource um, There, were, since there were so many Facebook groups. At the time, there were a bunch of Lyft driver Facebook groups, Uber driver Facebook groups. And I mean, there were national ones, there were local ones. And so I really, I took kind of a graph grassroots approach. And I started going into these Facebook groups, posting links to my articles whenever it was appropriate. And that's kind of when I discovered that, hey, um, I started running into problems because a lot of the administrators of these groups and forums that I was going into, they don't like anyone posting links to their site, to their personal site, Mm. right? And so I really... Yeah, basically that's what I was doing. I was spamming all of these forums. And for me, I was thinking in my head, hey, I'm not spamming. I'm providing really good information, really good content. And I was providing really good information, good content. I was doing really detailed breakdown of my earnings, talking about things like taxes, insurance, all these really important issues that no one else was talking about. But it was just the way that I was approaching it people didn't like. And so what I started doing was taking even more of a grassroots approach. So I would go through, I would answer people's questions in these Facebook groups, and then I would send them a personal message and say, hey, if you're interested, I have wrote an article that goes into more detail about this, or I have a site that covers topics like this. So I started doing stuff that was similar in approach, similar in that grassroots approach, but less spammy. And then I started doing the same thing on forums. I started going on Reddit. And I really just kind of took that grassroots approach, and I was making... 
slow but growing progress through a lot of those types of tactics. Wow. So one person at a time, one message I mean, at a time. You know what? And yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was a lot of work. Yeah, it was definitely a lot of work. Um, but at the same time, getting your content out there is tough. And I mean, I think that I started to discover some other ways. I mean, there are always little loopholes and kind of little tricks that I found. I mean, I remember at one point there was a Lyft blog. And so I was kind of commenting on all of those articles and it would allow me to link back to my site. And so I was getting a lot of referral traffic from that. Um, I was also uh, doing the occasional, you know, maybe some more stuff that you would call like gray hat stuff. Because for me, I really had nothing to lose. I was create, you know, I was creating maybe like a Reddit account, doing a bunch of posts, maybe doing five to 10 posts and then linking an article to my site. So for me, there was some stuff that, hey, I really at that point, I, 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 for me, I had nothing to lose and I was looking at this as a real business opportunity and I was either going to make it or not make it. <laughs> so I was really going all out and doing everything I could to try and get people to my site. And I was making slow progress. I mean, I was had a 200 two or three hundred page views a day and then kind of, you know, maybe slowly going up from there. And it was really once I started, I think that one of the big keys to my success was when I started reaching out to the media and developing relationships with these media members. That's when I think I started to really get that snowball and kind of have some more success and more traffic. So how long did it take to to get to a point where you called it successful, I guess. Was it six months, 12 months, 18 um, months? You know what? I would say that by once I started establishing some media relationships and started getting quoted in some media, um, you know, in some pretty respectable online publications, Forbes, Wired, Huffington Post, New York Times, that's kind of when I started real. That's when to me when I, I thought it was pretty successful. So that was about at the four to six month mark which is pretty quick. But uh, luckily, I think I had a big advantage because like you said, I, I started establishing myself as kind of this go-to industry expert. And all you know, as I later discovered, as I kind of became a media member, but um, a lot of these media reporters and personalities, they need sources. And I was really the perfect source because I, I was a driver. And I also had this platform where I was somewhat established and I at least looked credible on the outside. <laughs> I was, but I at least looked credible and I kind of could talk about all these issues and they really need it. You know, they need quotes because a lot of people don't realize, but reporters can't just make things up, right? Even if they know that, let's say they know that drivers are really angry about a certain situation, they need a quote from a driver that says that. And so that's kind of where I tried to be, be there for all these media members. And I really developed a ton of relationships with media members that way. How did you open those relationships? Just send a, a tweet or an email? Yeah, so I actually, and that's, this is kind of where all of my online, I'd say, you know, once I hit like the three to six month mark, this is where all my online marketing training started to <laughs> come in handy. Um, everything that I've been researching, you know, the, the guys like you talk about, the guys like Pat Flynn talk about, um, this is where I really started to you leverage all of that online marketing because I, I mean, I knew that it had worked for other guys. And so I started doing things like I did a Friday. So I hired a writer to do Friday roundups. Um, and I say hired. I actually had one of my friends who was just really passionate about the industry do it for free. So <laughs> he, uh, that was really nice. But he basically started doing these Friday roundups where we, at the time, all of these news stories were really hot. There were a ton of news going on about Uber, about Lyft, about all the issues surrounding it. And so we would feature maybe five to seven articles every week. And then I would have my virtual assistant go in there and I would have them follow all of the people that we are rounding up. So if we did seven, if we, let's say we did five, we featured five articles on our site, I would have my VA go in, follow all five of those reporters. Reporters love Twitter. They're all, every single reporter is on Twitter and they all are very active on Twitter too. And I kind of discovered that quickly. So I would have her follow all of those reporters. And then she would schedule tweets over the next day or two that would say, hey, um, at Yaro Starek, um, at Entrepreneur's Journey, we just featured an article in our latest roundup and then we would link to our roundup. And that was really for two purposes. That was obviously maybe they might retweet it, but it was more just to kind of establish that relationship so that they see, hey, okay, oh, who's this rideshare guy? Harry Campbell, he's featuring my articles. Cool, thanks. You know, we'll favor it. And maybe, you know, maybe in the future, they're probably not thinking maybe in the future we'll reach out to him. But now I'm kind of implanted in their head. And so we really, I started doing that pretty early on and we started seeing benefits from that pretty quickly. 
Um, after after a month or two of that, I took I went and had my VA go through find all of those reporters. So we kept a list of every single reporter we featured over two to three months, and then I reached out to them over email. And I actually I use a pretty cool uh, program that it's kind of like a plugin for Gmail called Mail Merge, and it allows you to personalize emails. So with a wildcard char- type character, so you would say hey hi, and then you would type in first name, and then when it and least save that as drafts. And so then when you go through, it seems like you're getting a personalized email. And so I sent that out to all the hundred reporters or so that I had at the time. And I basically just said, Hey, I don't, I didn't ask for anything, right? I just, I didn't say, Hey, if you want to quote me or if you want to link to me, you know, do that, right? Because these reporters, I think a lot of people don't realize how, just how many pitches these reporters get and most of them that they ignore. And most of these pitches are frankly very bad. And that's why I really wanted to stand out. So I kind of established myself a little bit with them on Twitter, maybe favored a few of their tweets, retweeted them, featured them in my articles, in my roundups. And then a month or two later, I sent them an email just reaching out and saying, Hey, I'm the rideshare guy. I run a, I'm an Uber driver myself. I run a blog and podcast for Uber drivers. I know there's a ton of information going on. A lot of it can be confusing. If you ever need any help, feel free to reach out to me. And that was really how I started establishing relationships with a lot of these reporters. I knew that if I went and ask them for something. Hey, do you want to quote me? Hey, do you want to link back to my site? Then I start to fall in line with all the other people who are contacting me, w- contacting them. So that's really how I tried to stand out with a lot of these media members. And it really started to pay off very, very quickly as soon as I sent that email, actually. Okay. So I can see how some really solid uh, networking, connecting mm-hmm. PR, but really just some very clever ways of getting attention and getting on the radar of the right people that's yeah. that's really important i can see that that would have turned into eventually some great chance to get exposure on much higher traffic sites so you went from that ground roots sending one message through reddit or facebook personal message or, mm-hmm. or a tweet so you're getting the ground roots get you up to two or three hundred page views yep. that gives you like okay i'm legitimate now to a degree and then yeah. you go to the more mainstream press you get more growth. So at what stage did your attention turn to making money from all this work you're putting in? Well, I would say that about that time where I started really reaching out to the media and started establishing relationships, because there were a lot of reporters at the time who were specifically covering the rideshare industry. Now that's kind of unique to, well, it's, I wouldn't say it's unique to every niche, but it's unique to this one because there was one reporter at Forbes who only wrote about Uber and Lyft and I tried to develop a really good relationship with her. And there was one reporter at BuzzFeed who did the same thing. So I was establishing relationships. I was really working hard to do establish relationships with those people, those like six to 10 reporters. But once I kind of did that, I'd say my first my first real step when I started to make money was about that time and it was off of driver referrals. So basically what I was doing at the time was I was... The thing that I think really made my content stand out and the thing that I think people really valued was that, hey, I was writing from firsthand experience. So I was talking about what it's like to be a driver, how I'm out there maximizing my income. And you've probably learned by now that I'm always trying to figure out ways to make the most amount of money in the least amount of time. And so I was doing, and with my engineering background, I was doing detailed spreadsheets, analysis on my earnings. And a lot of it was probably complicated and more information than most people wanted to know. But I think that it really showed that, hey, not only do I care about this, but I'm also very detailed and providing kind of above the top or above, you know, above what anyone else is doing as far as content. No one else was going out and doing this type, taking notes while they're driving and then writing about it and doing things like that. And that's what I was doing. And I think that type of content was really valuable to a lot of people. And I think that really it's that content. And I mean, I wasn't, you know, at the time there were, you were starting to see a lot of these sites where you see an affiliate marketing pop up and they say, they talk about how amazing this product is or how amazing driving is. Go sign up, use my code, right? That kind of like typical spammy affiliate marketing. Um, and I wasn't doing any of that though. I was saying exactly, hey, I was really like, what I really wanted to do is just tell it like it is. There are some good parts about driving, but there's also a lot of bad parts that a lot of 
people that aren't drivers may not realize. I mean, when Uber was lowering rates, drivers were now making a lot of a lot less money. And I was talking about those things. I wasn't just kind of saying, you know, kind of, oh, this is all roses, right? Mm. <laughs> I was talking about the things that were good and bad. And so people were finding my articles and, you know, maybe they would find an article about Uber and go sign up for Lyft because that was one of the strategies I talked about early on was driving for Lyft and Uber. And I was big proponent of say, hey, if you're a Lyft driver, you need to sign up with Uber and vice versa. So I was starting to get some signups off of that. And that was really kind of my first path to monetization. And I started getting these little bonuses anywhere from 50 to two or $300 for signing up new drivers and then them going out and doing 20 or 30 rides. Okay. So affiliate income is first. And that, that's, a, I guess, a unique mm -hmm. style of affiliate income. Very targeted, I guess. It's yeah. not, not unique in how it works. There's so many programs like that. But um, yeah. So you, you write these articles, people decide, I want to become a driver, or maybe they already are a driver, but they mm -hmm. haven't driven for one of the other companies. So I'm guessing, though, that's not enough money to, like, you know, retire. <laughs> so No, nope. and, and, you know, the thing that I knew about that, I, I've always treated the driver referral income as kind of like icing on the cake, because that's not... I mean, relying on someone else for your main source of income, right? And this is stuff that I talked about, you know, on the blog as far as, you know, if you're driving for Uber, you don't want to just rely on it. Look at these other services. So there's a lot of parallels, which I think is really cool about. There are a lot of parallels to kind of the things that I talk about for Uber drivers and what I'm doing in my own business and kind of like what entrepreneurs and online marketers do themselves. Because really, a lot of people don't realize that Uber drivers are their own business. They file a Schedule C in the US. They get you know, they get paid 1099. And so they are their own business, basically. Mm -hmm. And they're running their own business. A lot of them don't treat it like they're running their own business. But that's kind of where my site started to help. Um, and you're right, though, as far as the actual income, the driver referrals, I knew that it was kind of like icing on the cake, it could go away at any time. And once I really started building up my following, um, my driver referral income was increasing. And it was pretty significant income at the time. Um, you know, it was definitely in the few thousand dollars a month range. And that's when I started saying, hey, I'm going to definitely, I'm going to take advantage of these driver referrals as long as I can. But at the same time, I'm starting to build some traffic and I see that there are some definite potential opportunities in the way of even things like Google ads and kind of setting up affiliate relationships. And obviously, I had listened to a lot of online marketing guys. And, uh, you know, the first thing they say is go build a product or build a digital product, build a course. And so I really started looking at those types of monetization opportunities. I was even doing, you know, at the time I was even doing kind of like that, you know, I, I, I guess I like to say that I started small with small stuff. Like I was doing coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching with drivers for $50 for a half hour. Um, Lyft had a cool feature where you could do, I was a mentor with Lyft. So that what that basically meant the, was that I would get paid $35 for doing a little 20 minute test drive with new drivers. So I was having drivers in the area who are interested in me being their mentor. The rideshare guy could be their mentor, right? <laughs> and it wouldn't cost them anything. And they would come drive to me and I would spend 20 minutes, make a quick $35 and be now I'd, I was their mentor. So I was doing a lot of those types of smaller things at first and really just seeing where the monetization opportunities were. Because like I said earlier, I knew that there was going to be a ton of opportunity. I just wasn't sure exactly where it was going to come from. So break it down today. I, I've got the list in front of me. You, mm -hmm. You've got Google Ads. I'm assuming that's Google AdSense. Yeah, that's two to three thousand a month. And you said you've got around four hundred and twenty thousand page views. So that's a lot yeah. of traffic. And actually, you know, I, I, it's funny, kind of to show you kind of the the strength or the, kind of the growth on my site. I think that I sent you that a week or two ago. And the last time I checked over my last thirty day period, I think I'm now up around four fifty page views for the month. So I've definitely had some pretty nice and consistent growth over the past year. Okay, so AdSense is pretty straightforward. You slap the mm -hmm. code on your site and suddenly you're making two to three grand a month. Is that what happened? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I mean, honestly, I didn't even have AdSense up there to start. And I, I'd say that for bloggers who are out there, if, you know, what I really think that is like once you kind of get into the 100,000 page views a month, range, that's when you can really consider start making a full-time income. And it might not be a ton of money, but that's when you can really start looking at things like Google AdSense for real monetization opportunities, affiliate products, direct relationships, and also just taking advantage of whatever opportunities there are in your niche. Because as we're going to kind of talk about, there's some unique, um, I guess you would say, monetization opportunities that I found that might not be available in every niche. But I do think that there are these types of 
of unique monetization opportunities in every niche. They're just different for every niche. Okay, so we're getting down to the last sort of five to ten minutes, Harry. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to just quickly break down what these are. So yeah, um, sure. do you want to just roll through the, the list you've given me and how, how much each makes? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I kind of have a sort of a range here because obviously some of them are, are a bit cyclical. And I mean, just with the industry in general, I mean, the monetization strategy, I guess that you would say that I have right now is kind of always changing and always evolving. And in a year, I suspect it'll look very different. Um, but the, that these are all kind of the avenues I'm exploring. I guess after Google Ads, um, I'm also doing more traditional affiliate type stuff with companies that I've found um, that are really, re- you know, the nice thing is there are a lot of companies that are really related to drivers. And one that one of my bigger partners is a company called Your Mechanic. And for example, they do um, on-demand oil changes, basically on-demand car work. So they'll come to your home or business and do oil, do an oil change, change your brakes. Um, and their prices are very comparable or even less than a traditional shop since they don't have a shop themselves. So it's kind of like that Uber model applied to the car repair industry. And so obviously for my audience, that's a very target, you know, that's kind of like the perfect product to promote. Um, so they're one of my affiliate partners. And then another company, there are a lot of other companies that there are one that I work with specifically that's been around for a while is called Sherpa Share. And they're basically an app that uh, helps drivers maximize their income, track their expenses, track their earnings. They integrate directly with your Uber account, Lyft, Postmates, all of these services. And they're really one of the bigger kind of, uh, I guess you would say, companies supporting drivers. But I know that kind of going forward, I think that's going to be a huge affiliate opportunity for me. Um, Just these companies that are supporting drivers. So all of these companies that are looking to help maximize drivers' income. And I mean, I, I won't go through them but there there's hundred basically I'll tell you that there's hundreds of companies in development right now I know because they all pitch me <laughs> and they, you know they might not be quite mature yet where they have an affiliate program but in the next year or two there'll be a lot of potential affiliate programs and we've actually seen this with the Airbnb industry there's a bunch of things like Guesty and all these companies that basically will go and help Airbnb owners, you know, manage their listing. So there are a lot of affiliate opportunities with that Airbnb side that I think will be coming to the rideshare industry in the next year or two. And then I also have more traditional affiliate stuff like Amazon Associates. And obviously Amazon is nice because you can link to any product without any real conflicts of interest. And then credit card stuff. I mean, if drivers want to go out and sign up for business credit cards, and those are all in the you know few hundred dollars a month range. But I mean, they they add up and they don't really require a whole lot of. Motion. I just stick a few links here and there or whenever it comes up. And, you know, beyond affiliate marketing, I'd say one area where I'm really, I've really just in the past few months, I'm really starting to focus is direct advertising. So what I mean by direct advertising is basically establishing relationships that are not always, I mean, it could be an affiliate relationship, but generally it's more of a direct media buy where they want to do basically a lot of these companies might do paid marketing on things like Google AdSense, right? But if they come to my site and buy a banner ad, obviously, that's their target audience. So companies, so for example, right now I'm working with a company called Stride Health and they're a company that basically provides health insurance. They're a kind of like they'll help you find a health insurance plan here in the US. And for a lot of freelance workers and a lot of Uber drivers who don't have health insurance or need to buy it through the cover, you know, the California exchange or whatever state they're in exchange, this company actually gets, they are, they're free to use. And so they're kind of one of the companies that are advertising with me. So with them, I try to give them stuff like, I try to do a lot of the direct advertising in areas where I can't do Google ads. So for example, I can obviously do Google ads all over my my site. But with them, I might put a, an ad at the top of my newsletter. So I have a cool little banner space at the top of my email newsletter that goes out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, whenever we release an article. And that has closed that at this point that has 10,000 subscribers and a 40% open rate. So that's 4,000 times four. So that's 16,000 people that are going to see their ad as soon as they open that email, boom, right there, sign up for Stride Health, right? So that's 16,000 super targeted people right there. And I can't put a Google ad right there in that email. So that's kind of an example of how I'm using that direct advertising. And then beyond that, it's also, I've been working with a couple couple companies that were finalizing deals, but it's going to be more native content. So 
I'm not necessarily trying to hide the fact that these companies are advertising with me, but whenever I find a product that really aligns with driver's best interest, instead of just writing a review of this product and saying, hey, here's a car leasing program. You guys should go and sign up for it. Here's how it works. I really kind of go in and find all of the pain points that drivers are having, all the issues they're having, and I write content built around that, and that's kind of called native advertising. And then I work out a deal with them and post the article and post a link to sign up for it down at the bottom. And obviously at the bottom, I said, hey, if you want to use our link to sign up, here it is. And so it's really basically with the goal of that native advertising is I want people to read the article and not even realize that that was an advertisement, but provide value to them and provide them a ton of information about the product or the content I'm talking about, but also provide information that or be, also provide value to that advertiser. So that's kind of... Um, what I'm doing with direct advertising. Now, I have a few more. Do you want me to keep going? Keep going. (laughs) Um, And the other thing that I really started focusing on about six months ago, took a little bit of a break, but I'm really starting to re-up again um, now that I'm motivated because, frankly, it was a lot of work to launch, was my video course. Now, up until about the beginning of the year, everything that I'd been doing to make money was the nice thing about what I was doing. A lot of it was not requiring my users to pay any money, right? They were either signing up to be a driver or signing up for free products or maybe signing up for an oil change that they needed anyways, right? And it wasn't really costing them anything. And so I was a little bit apprehensive about launching this video course where, hey, now I'm going to be charging people. And I charged a lot because it was a lot of work. (laughs) I charged... So we ended up, I went with a partner and a guy that I found on YouTube and uh, we charged, he was doing YouTube videos basically for rideshare drivers and I didn't have a YouTube channel at the time. So I started one and we started working together. We created a course called MaximumRideSharingProfits.com and it was basically a standard course with five modules, a gold course with five modules. So each video in the module was 20 to 30 minutes and so that's you know about 10 videos anywhere from uh, maybe about 15 to 25 minutes at each video. Very well organized. He had a big background in online marketing. So he took care of all the back end stuff. I did most of the promotion and marketing on my end. And that course, we launched that. And that course has been selling pretty consistently $2,000, two to $3,000 a month. So over the past six months, and we kind of took a break from it for a few months, but now I'm really starting to re-up it and create an affiliate program and do all of that, that good stuff with the video course. So... How much do you charge for that course? That course is $97 for the entire course. Okay. And I actually just... up. We, we didn't plan on updating it, but uh, what I kind of quickly realized was that people want more advanced stuff. They kind of want updates. So we just added three new videos. We'll probably add a few videos. And we're kind of building out that course to be sort of its own separate property. So we created a blog and we're basically pushing all of my... So I release YouTube videos every Tuesday, Thursday. But the YouTube videos don't get sent out, really. It's only people that find them on my channel. So we started sending out those YouTube videos as the video and then a transcript um, over on MaximumRideSharingProfits.com. So we're sending that out as blog posts, basically, and kind of just leveraging all of my existing content. So that's what I've done with the course. And I'll just talk about just quickly. I mean, the other, I guess the other, the big one is I'm still doing lead gen for a lot of these companies. So I'm signing up drivers for Uber, Lyft, Sidecar, Postmates, DoorDash. And generally, once these companies start to go in 10 to 15 cities or more nationwide, that's when I'll take over or that's when I'll start promoting. And that's kind of more on your traditional affiliate marketing. But the big thing that we've seen is, I mean, these bonuses are still out there uh, for rideshare. A lot of the delivery companies like Postmates and DoorDash, which basically deliver food from restaurants to your home on demand. They're starting to need a lot of drivers. So I think that there's going to be some pretty big lead gen opportunities probably indefinitely just because these there's very high turnover in these industries and these companies need a lot of workers. Um, and then I've also been kind of discovering... I'll just talk about two more Um, I've been kind of discovering these smaller opportunities. For example, I started consulting for a few companies here and there. So I might do one or two consulting sessions a month for an hour or two. And I charge a very high premium because I have a very very specific (laughs) uh, knowledge base, I guess you would say. And there's probably no one who really knows more about the driver and rideshare experience from that point of view. I would almost, I mean, maybe not in the world, but probably if someone's looking for that type of information, they need to come to me and I charge a premium for it. So the consulting 
is something that I know that I could probably explore in the future and potential speaking gigs once they start having the first rideshare conference. <laughs> but uh, once that comes around. And the last thing I'll talk about is something that one of these opportunities that I kind of discovered that I think kind of these opportunities exist in every niche, but it takes a little work to find them. And so one of the issues a lot of drivers were having was with their auto insurance. So since this is such kind of a new and transformative industry, a lot of the auto insurance policy Policies haven't caught up and there isn't there wasn't really the right personal policy you know it wasn't quite a personal policy that you needed but you also didn't need commercial insurance and so they started coming up with these hybrid policies about six months ago and a lot of drivers may not realize it but there's some insurance gaps as drivers if they just use their personal auto insurance to drive for uber and lyft and now frankly 80 to 90 percent of drivers are doing that but a lot of the ones who kind of do their research and figure out that hey i need a policy that's going to cover me um, for these instances. So we went out and we basically found a bunch of agents who either our readers recommended or someone recommended to us or they reached out to us. We vetted them and we created basically an insurance, an auto insurance marketplace by state on our site. And we direct traffic. We write maybe one article a month on the insurance topic, on the topic surrounding auto insurance. We drive traffic back to that page. It does really well in SEO. I try to link to it wherever I can, whenever it's appropriate. And we actually ended up, I think now we're up to about 12 or 15 independent insurance agents that are all paying anywhere from a hundred to a few hundred dollars a month to be listed on there because we have such high traffic at this point where, and it's such a, it's such a product that drivers need that a lot of these agents are able to basically get leads from us. And it seems to be going well for them because they're all renewing. So maybe that means I should be charging more. <laughs> Phew. All right. That's, that's yeah. a huge breakdown, Harry. Um, <laughs> I, we, we've pretty much run out of time, but I do want to ask you one thing because I'm kind of curious. Sure. This has turned into a massive bunch of things. Like <laughs> there's so much yeah. content you're talking, YouTube channel, digital course. There's like 15 different income streams here. I'm assuming you've quit your job a long time ago. So oh, yeah. could you I probably should have mentioned that I did quit my job about six months ago. Well, th this can answer this question. Um, <laughs> what does a day in the life of Harry Campbell look like today? Um, well, I guess it depends on the day because on excuse me on Monday, Tuesdays, I sort of schedule out my day a little bit more, take phone calls, do meetings, things like that. But I'd say a typical day, I usually spend probably the first hour or two of the day doing emails, taking phone calls, um, doing kind of like general organizational stuff. And I mean, one of the things for me that's been huge is I still respond to every single email that I get. I mean, one of the quick things that I saw early on was just there's really lacking communication from a lot of these on-demand companies. So when you email Uber, for example, you don't always get a very good response. You may not even get a response. So I kind of wanted to be the opposite. I wanted when people to email me, I wanted them to really get a re good response and I wanted them to always hear from me. And so that's one of those things that I spend a lot of time on. I frankly, I track all my time with a, a cool program and I spend a lot of time on email, 30 to 40% of my time just replying to emails, communication, and and then beyond that, though, I work with my team. So I have a team of three writers, three virtual assistants, a web designer, so and then a couple guys that handle advertising and partnerships for me. So I work with them. I spend you know an hour, hour and a half every day coordinating stuff with them. And then maybe every day or every maybe every other day, I'm work maybe every day <laughs> I'm working on some type of content, whether it's prepping for a podcast, prepping for YouTube videos, prepping for an article, or actually going out and writing the article, writing. Right, or recording the podcast or recording the YouTube. And then I like to cook, so I usually cook dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Watch an hour of TV with my wife, check email maybe one more time at the end of the night, and then go to bed and wake up and do it all again the next day. And it's awesome. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Okay, fantastic. You wouldn't do it if you didn't enjoy it. So you've built a really amazing content uh, business. It's, it's quite incredible um, what you've done, actually, because there's a lot of moving parts there. And uh, yeah. it sounds like you know, you're, you're controlling a lot of things. So um, websites, let's just go through them again. So if people want to check out what you're doing, the main one is the rideshareguy.com. Yep. Now, you mentioned your course, which is maximum rideshareingprofits.com and don't try to type it in just use a link it'll be a lot easier to find <laughs> so basically go to rideshare the rideshareguy.com and everything yeah. you can find from there i'm assuming you can find your youtube channel under a uh, the same name and yeah all yep. right yeah. huge and 
I actually have the podcast too that I do. Uh, you know, the one thing that I really enjoyed about the podcast is because I love entrepreneurial podcasts just like yours and others who interview, inter- interview entrepreneurs. And that's kind of the one of the parallels that I found with my podcast is I really like to, you know, I don't just talk about rideshare topics on my podcast. I talk about every, I mean, I even did one podcast on how I'm making money with my blog. So if people want to know more about that, but it's really a lot of these kind of marketing and tactics to parallel entrepreneurship and rideshare. And that's really what I, those are the topics I love exploring on my podcast. Didn't even mention a podcast. So throw the podcast into the mix as well with all the other content you're doing is incredible. Yep. Um, Harry. Did I not mention that? I, well, now you have. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 I'm sure there's at least one or two takeaways for any person doing anything yeah. online in your story because you've covered so many different types of things you've done from the early days to the present day. So thank you for laying it all out there. Awesome. Yeah, it was really fun. And I'm, I'm just kind of glad. I mean, for me, I was kind of in your audience shoes just a year ago. And I was kind of listening to all these podcasts and learning from people who had done it. So for me, it's like really exciting to kind of have seen some success and also more importantly, just share it because I mean, my site is all about helping drivers and selfishly, it feels good to do something that you love, but that also helps people. So mm-hmm. if my story can help people, I think that that's kind of a good thing for everyone involved. Since we're already over an hour, I'm just going to ask you this question and we'll, we'll make <laughs> sure. it even longer here. I, I, I love to end this for, like you just said, the person listening to the show who is not where you're at, they're where mm-hmm. you used to be. Now, I'm thinking as they listen to you, they're going, oh my gosh, there's so many things I have to do, so much content, researching, advertising, there's a lot of work. Yeah. Where would you suggest they start, especially if they're feeling overwhelmed now? I mean, honestly, I think it all starts with content. For me, writing good content, if you don't have the good content, people aren't going to find you. I would start with content. Find something you're passionate about and that you think maybe there's a little opportunity because... I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up. If you start an online business or even especially a blog with the intention of making money and you want to get rich or if you want to make a full-time income, it, you know, the odds are the odds are stacked against you. But I do think that if you start something that you're passionate about and after a year, after 2 years, you've done it and maybe you want to move on to something else, you don't ever want to feel like you've gone into a project and at the end of it, when it's all said and done, you're, you can be disappointed, but you don't want to feel like you wasted your time. So that's why I think it's really important that if you pick something that you're passionate about, at, let's say with this rideshare project at the end of one year, if I didn't see that success, at least, hey, I worked on it for a year, I'm going to move on, find something new, but find something else that I'm passionate about. So that's why I think where that passion really comes into play and can make a huge difference. Okay. All about passion. All right. Yeah. Harry, thank you for joining me today and sharing your story. And thank you, everyone else, for listening in. This has been the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. If you do want to get the show notes, the transcript, or download any of the uh, MP3s, if you haven't got it already, for this interview with Harry, just head to entrepreneurs-journey and then click the podcast tab. Or just Google my name, Yaro, Y-A-R-O, and you'll find all the downloads there. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and I'll talk to you on a podcast very soon. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Harry Campbell. I really appreciated him going into so much depth of his background story, what led up to what he's currently doing, and of course, really breaking down the details of his current ride-sharing blogging business. A reminder again to go to interviewsclub.com and enter your email address on that page to sign up for updates whenever I release a brand new EJ podcast. And also, I'd really appreciate it if you could spend five minutes now by going to iTunes and leaving a review and a five-star rating for the EJ podcast. If you love this show and you want to certainly see me continue to produce this show, I really appreciate the thank you by leaving a review in iTunes. That's it for this episode. My name is Yaro Starek, and I'll talk to you again on the next episode of the EJ Podcast.